Yes, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the diagnostic label of Alzheimer's disease with its devastating effects on the human brain. An estimated 5 million Americans have the disease and many millions more are affected by it if we take into account family members and caregivers. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Lobby Talk Beyond Medicine, meeting the challenge of Alzheimer's disease today. I'm Patty Satalia and the turnout here in the outreach building on Penn State's University Park campus, I think, speaks to the desire for new information. Over the past 20 years, great progress has been made in understanding some of the biological mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease, but existing pharmaceutical treatments are marginally effective at best, while truly effective treatments, let alone prevention or cure, remain on the distant horizon. We won't be talking about warning signs or cures tonight. Instead, we'll be challenging the common ways in which we think about dementia and how we treat it. Are there other approaches to dealing with this condition that could help people with dementia and their families now? Our guests today will share their perspectives and experiences that go beyond the biomedical approach and that focus on expanding the current thinking on Alzheimer's disease. They'll also take questions from our studio audience, so let's meet them. Dr. Ann Basting has developed creative approaches to dementia that involve the use of storytelling, drama, and the arts. She is director of the Center on Age and Community and an associate professor in the Department of Theater and Dance at the Peck School of the Arts at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee and has written extensively on issues of aging and representation. She is currently working on a new book titled Forget Memory, Imagining a Better Life for People with Dementia. Dr. Peter Whitehouse is a geriatric neurologist, neuroscientist, and bioethicist. For two decades, he worked as a clinician and researcher developing and evaluating drug treatments for dementia. Growing dissatisfaction with the biomedical approach to treatment led him to develop a clinical approach built around the power of stories to assist those with aging-associated cognitive challenges. His NIH-funded research focuses on quality of life, ethics, intervention trials, and genetic testing in dementia. He is a professor of neurology, psychiatry, neuroscience, and organizational behavior at Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Stephen Zaret is one of the most widely recognized researchers in the world on issues related to family caregiving for the elderly with dementia, the health and functioning of the oldest old, and the development of prevention and treatment programs for mental health problems in later life. He is professor of human development and head of the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at Penn State. Dr. Jacqueline Duffin is a PhD MD, a hematologist. She worked as a physician for many years before becoming the Hannah Chair in the History of Medicine at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She and a cognitive neuropsychologist, also at Queen's University, are exploring the possibility that music recognition is spared in dementia. Thank you all so much for joining us. Before we talk about some of the new concepts, and all of you have some exciting things uh, that I'm anxious to help you share, um, but before we talk about that, Take us back, if you would, uh, Dr. Whitehouse, to 1907 and tell us a bit about the German psychiatrist Alos Alzheimer's and his 51-year-old patient. Dr. Alzheimer was a psychiatrist um, practicing at a time that we now refer to as brain psychiatry. It was an exciting time for them back then because they were developing the techniques to look inside the brain and image the brain through the microscope. Uh, so he was a practicing psychiatrist and he saw a woman by the name of Augusta Dieter uh, at Frankfurt, where he was at that time, examined her clinically, and uh, was puzzled by the early age of onset, 51, and um, uh, it, it, he wasn't quite sure how to classify um, uh, her, her particular problem. Uh, she unfortunately died about five years later, and uh, Dr. Alzheimer um, moved to Munich, and uh, we know all this story because the tissues were actually found in Munich, and, and I've actually had the opportunity to see those tissues. Uh, he made the right diagnosis, I guess you would say, although he himself was puzzled about whether Alzheimer's disease was a separate entity, and that puzzlement still sticks with us today, a hundred years later. And in, he actually had her remains shipped to him, and he biopsied them and found the tangles and the plaques that we now uh, really are the hallmarks of, of Alzheimer's disease. He had friends who developed stains. Uh, it's a funny word, but you take brain tissue, it kind of looks a little like jelly. You can't really see anything, and you sprinkle a little of this, these colored chemicals on the brain, and you can see these tangles and plaques. So he was fortunate to be 
uh, practicing in an era where these techniques were developed. So he was the first to see that combination of plaques and tangles that his boss, uh, Emil Kreplin, who was famous in psychiatry for his textbook, uh, said, this is, this is interesting, let's talk about it in our textbook. Got in the textbook and then it became Alzheimer's disease. So from one person, we now have, as you said, perhaps five million in this country, of people affected by the label. And that's what we're here to explore. What does this label mean? What did it mean to Alzheimer's and what should it mean to us for the next hundred years? And we're going to get back to that. You teach the history of medicine. Why do you think it's important, especially for medical students, to understand the history of medicine? Well, I think that it isn't going to predict the future, but it gives us a deeper understanding of the present, uh, how we got to where we are. One of the things that's important to realize, as you just heard, is that a hundred years ago, there was no Alzheimer's disease. It hadn't been distinguished from other forms of aging at all. And on some level, every disease is an idea. And if a disease is an idea, it has a history. And that, I think, is very important for us to realize for every disease in our time. Dr. Alzheimer actually presented a paper describing the puzzling symptoms that he saw in this 51-year-old patient, and we have produced a short dramatization of that based on verbatim uh, excerpts from his published notes, and let's have a look at that right now. What is your name? Auguste. Family name. Auguste. What is your husband's name? I believe Auguste. Your husband? Oh, my husband. Are you married? To Auguste. Mrs. D? Yes, to Auguste D. How long have you been here? Three weeks. Uh, what do I have in my hand? A cigar? Yes. And that? A pencil. Right again. And um, what is that? A, a, a book. And what is lying next to my notebook? A, a bunch of keys. Consisting of what? Individual keys. Dr. Alzheimer sensed that there was something special about Auguste D. He decided to examine her himself. He did not yet know on that gloomy November day that he was making the most momentous decision of his life. The same evening, Dr. Alzheimer continued his examination, handing Auguste D. a pencil and paper. What is your name? May. Write your name down. She wrote, May. Write something. She wrote something illegible. Who are you? Mrs. D. Write it down. She wrote Mrs. D and read aloud, Auguste D. Alzheimer pointed to the word Mrs. What is that word? Yes, yes, uh, Mrs. Auguste D. Where is Auguste written? Uh. Auguste D did not react. Dr. Alzheimer wrote the word garden on the left margin of the page. Auguste D wrote Mrs. D. Alzheimer repeated the request to write something. Again, Auguste D. wrote something illegible. Write a five. She wrote, Mrs. Write an eight. She wrote, Augufe. Dr. Alzheimer turned the pencil upside down in her hand. At first, she made several attempts to write with the upside down pencil then used it properly. Alzheimer could not get the case of Auguste D out of his mind.
This uh, 100th anniversary of uh, the diagnosis of uh, Alzheimer's disease has you thinking that perhaps it's a good time to reflect on the label itself. Explain what you mean by that. I think 100-year anniversaries tend to signal a chance to um, reflect. Um, when you let doctors reflect on history, though, they tend to tell rather optimistic stories about what's happened and where we're going. Um, and I wish all those optimistic stories were true. Uh, to me, uh, I saw it as a chance, though, to reflect on what we've really learned. And even though we can't, as our real historian here has answered, predict the future, at least we can understand how we got to be where we are in a bit more honest and deeper way. And perhaps that will help us go forward. You were involved in the development of the first four medications that were used for Alzheimer's disease. Before we uh, find out a little bit about what some of our other panelists are involved in, why did you grow dissatisfied with the biomedical approach? I think it's incomplete. Uh, it, you know, being a doctor in these times with mapping the human genome and all the hopes and expectations from that is enormously exciting, uh, but it is limiting. Um, and we've seen the limitations from these medicines. Um, we can understand one small piece of a brain change and we can have one medicine that acts on that, but it's only the only part of the story. Um, and the cost of drugs and the influence of thinking that all we really need to do to take care of our aging is to take the right pill. To me, those are the wrong attitudes. We, we're responsible for our brain aging. There's more you can do than I can do as a doctor uh, to help you um, age well and your loved ones age well. And that's, I think, what we're here to talk about. Okay. Let's, let's get a, a question from the audience. Go ahead, please. Well, not a question exactly, but an observation that I hope some of you will react to. Um, nearly 20 years ago now, I watched my father die from the word cancer, not from the disease. He died far sooner than his uh, clinical condition would have, uh, would have predicted. So after I'd spent a year <laughs> trying to persuade my husband to have a checkup, which he didn't think normal people did, but I knew there were some um, cognitive changes going on, um, I forbade our physician to use the words dementia and Alzheimer's, and we settled upon the term memory dysfunction because um, my husband is a, well, he's got a quick wick. <laughs> and um, I know that there are people who have, who have committed suicide over the name of a diagnosis. Interesting. Um, Dr. Sarah, could you comment on that? And, and, and yeah. I want to say first that um, Dr. Kevorkian's first suicide, uh, first patient he ever assisted in suicide was someone very early in Alzheimer's, and I think it was partly the fear of that diagnosis. Dr. Certainly Sarah? the fear, and, and unfortunately a case that was a questionable diagnosis to begin with. But I wanted to respond by saying, uh, again, as we're talking historically, uh, I received my early training, uh, both in research and, and clinical practice as a psychologist, at a time when we used different terminologies. We talked about chronic organic brain syndrome uh, and, and other terms. And families grew attached to the term Alzheimer's then and saw it as an improvement. The idea was that this was now something tangible, medical, and it gave them hope. And I think what we've seen is that a, a term that advanced the field, that galvanized energy, that brought scientists together to search for a cause has now taken on its own stigma and fears. And I, I think this is where an understanding of where we've come from and where we're going is important. And Dr. Bernstein? I would add to that saying it's not just the person you need to worry about having a reaction to the fear. It's the whole social network around them because I always like to say that it's not just the neuron that gets isolated when the synapses break. It's the person because people don't know how to talk to them. It's, it's similar in a grief situation when someone doesn't know how to address the fact that someone's grieving or experiencing loss in any way. We don't have a real clear way of, of understanding how to speak with people who have memory loss or dementia. We, we sort of fall away. And that's also something to be really worried about. You're doing some exciting work that's getting people reconnected, not only family members with a, a loved one who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, uh, but also with staff in nursing homes who are becoming connected in a way they weren't perhaps before 
with patients. Tell us something of what you're doing. Well, I, I think the basis of it is actually that we think there's nothing left. We're so convinced by the loss message that we don't think there's anything there. So we, we stop at the loss. Um, and one of the things that's still there, I think, is, is the um, capacity to communicate emotionally. Um, if rational language or you know, regular logical language, however you want to word it, is broken down, the emotional exchange can still be there. And the arts is all based on emotional exchange, right? So to me, the arts are the way to teach people to communicate um, with people with dementia. And that's really what I've been doing for, it's hard to believe, but 10 years now. Um, it started out with creative storytelling, and now we're finding kind of like-minded programs in visual arts and music and dance and poetry and collage and sculpture, and it just keeps going. Why is creativity so important for those with dementia? Um, in my work, I see it as being uh, providing access to meaning making again, which is, I, I think, people with dementia start isolating themselves as well um, because they're assuming they're going to not make sense. Um, and people are not are going to react to what they're saying in a negative way. So they just learn to kind of smile and nod and close off their language and communication. Um, creativity and creative expression allows them to experiment with communication again. Um, and when you train the family or the staff how to communicate in that way, it opens back up a channel where people thought it was completely broken. Most of what you're doing, too, I guess all of what you're doing, there's no risk involved for, uh, for the Alzheimer's patients. They can express themselves, and there's no wrong answer. And it's, it's interesting how you've set this up in that way. Well, I think you have to, I mean, there, no wrong answers in the mind of the listener, right? So you have to really train people Again, not to stop, because uh, when we're around people with dementia, say your friends, um, we're, we're the carriers of the loss. We recognize the loss. And so to sort of convince yourself to look past it and not just be the memory of the loss for that person, but to go where they are and to try to communicate with who they are right now, that's, that's the real trick. But the, we, you know, the failure-free sort of um, model of it is what I think is so promising, that someone can experiment um, and try to communicate with only sounds or only gesture. And some of those moments are truly magical. You're talking about a specific program that you work on called Time Slips. And it's based on facilitators helping residents and family members, uh, rather than reminiscing or, or telling personal stories, making up, imagining a story based on a provocative picture. Tell us something about that, and then I'd like to show a clip so oh, that's people right, can you really see what it is you're doing out there. Well, it started um, because it's, it's a long story of how it started. I'll make it short. Um, it was essentially I was trying a lot of reminiscence techniques with people with dementia, and they were all failing. It was a very intense nursing home situation where I was working. And one day I thought, you know what? I'm going to leave memory over there, and I'm going to go over into imagination completely. And we just went off on that track. And it was really a flowering. We ended up starting with a picture that we used of the Marlboro Man. And the story that we told went on for 45 minutes. And it was really a, a transformative moment for me. It kept me doing the same thing for 10 years. <laughs> you can imagine the power of that first moment. And we start with a picture. We ask open-ended questions that really allow the person to come up with any answer. Because if you ask a fact-based or an episodic question of episodic memory, there's really only one answer. And most likely, that pathway is broken. So it's a frustrating experience to try to respond to it. If you ask a question that's open-ended, there's a million avenues for you know, pathways that could potentially lead to communication. So we try to ask very open-ended questions. And I think you see the joy of the experience. You say this works best as a group process. And I think it's surprising that it also works best with uh, mid and late stage patients. <laughs> yeah. Why is that the case? I think when people watch the footage even, they assume that these are people in early stage because they're so communicative, but they're all in middle to, to late stage. We find that people who are really strongly aware of their own memory loss are very um, protective of making sense and getting down the information that they have. 
And that's fantastic. That means that they'd, they'd probably respond better and enjoy doing reminiscence more. Um, but in the middle stages where they aren't um, as hung up about that, they're more free to go into the imagination and to really um, benefit from this kind of an approach. All right, let's have a look. We have a boy named Dimrock who is 10 years old. He is in Alaska living by himself. Now, in his hand, yes. he either has a long whip, says Nathan, or he has a snake ready to bite him in the you-know-where, says Roger. Oh, did I say that? You did, Roger. I was Miss Papoosing. You did you, Miss Papoosing? Miss Papoosing. I was Miss Papoosing. Uh, they, they don't have a paper. So they don't you. So what is Dimrock going to do after he's done hunting? Jim Rock? Jim Rock. Jim Rock. Jim Rock. Jim Rock. Jim Rock. Jim Rock. Oh, go home and eat? What's he gonna eat? Oh, he has his sure, like food service to him. Yeah. Really? Yeah, he he belongs to this uh, yeah, this uh, 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 meal on wheels. Meal, <laughs> meal, 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 meal on wheels. <laughs> you know, I knew that woman was alive sitting there, and I knew she'd come up with something really <laughs> terrific. Wow, they have it. That was oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Read the story back. And after he's done hunting, he's going to go home and eat food, which is delivered by Meals on Wheels, says Ida. And Roger says that the wheels keep the food hot. And their specialty for tonight is sweet and sour squirrel, said Rose. Oh, that's good. Fish fries. She told us how to make it. You have the squirrel and pine nuts, raisins, onions, carrots, celery. Pine nuts, raisins. Yeah, and it's fried and then baked. Or it's fried and then baked. Right. With a light tomato sauce. Right. And you say, Dr. Basting, that this can be implemented with, uh, among anyone with a passion for expression. Really, as long as you can resist correcting or supplying answers. That's the key. You're really, as a facilitator, you're there to open up avenues for creative expression for other people for the people with dementia. Talk a little bit, if you would, Dr. Zarat, about what saying no means to someone who's suffering from dementia, a word that they often hear over and over again as they're struggling to communicate and, and get their needs met. Well, I really agree with what Anne has been saying. I think that uh, saying no again is dealing with things on a factual level rather than playing to the person's strengths. She said, you've got to, and it's really the central thing about caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease, you've got to put memory over there and deal with the things that the person can still do. The other thing in that remarkable tape, that wonderful tape, is that there's a social interaction that's meaningful to those people that's going on. And often we isolate the patient in an artificial situation where they're sitting home alone all day or with just one-to-one -one with the caregiver and the caregiver gets it in their head oh I can't possibly you know put the person in a social situation can't possibly take them to a daycare program or anything like that but you can see when there's an opportunity for the right kind of interaction how enriching that can be. Speaking of enriching, and we're going to get back to, to more about the Time Slips program, but Dr. Duffin is doing some fascinating work as well on music and memory. Uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the 84-year-old woman who inspired you to look at whether, for some reason, um, music memory is spared in dementia. Thank you. This is work I've done with uh, Lola Cuddy, who's a cognitive neuropsychologist at Queens, where I come from. And uh, she had been studying music perception in people who had had strokes. And she knew where their problem was in the brain. And she was interested in whether or not they could recover their musicality <laughs> and their language. And I was aware of uh, E.N., the patient that we wrote about, uh, who could sing lots of songs, second, third, and fourth verses of songs she had learned, perhaps even as an adult, but also as a child but who was very severely demented and could not recognize family members, couldn't uh, be drawn out by photographs. There were, there were no sort of active memories. And it struck her family members uh, that this was actually a memory. And in fact, many people who look after uh, dementia patients know that they respond to music, that they'll light up when music comes into a room, and I'm sure many people in the room have actually seen that, and people who haven't, I see some heads nodding, but uh, people who haven't spoken necessarily suddenly start singing along with a song. And uh, what we did was take these standardized tests that had been standardized on 
uh, normal elderly people and apply them to EN. And, and instead of giving her the instructions or handing her an answer sheet where she had to check the right box, we just watched her. And if she sang along with it, I guess she knew it. And very often, we would give her the cue, she would sing along with it, and then keep going when the music stopped. We have a clip of music, in fact, too. If you'd begin, Dr. Duffin, by telling us how you uh, tested EM. Yes. Uh, we tested her with these standardized tests, and I think you're about to hear a clip from one of those tests, so you can all test yourself. <laughs> see if you recognize. And, uh, see if you recognize the tune, and this is what she would have heard. And of course, she did recognize that. She tune. recognized it. She sang along with it, and as soon as it stopped, she kept going, singing all the rest of it, and didn't much like it when we started the next clip. <laughs> now, why, why do you suppose that happens? Is there something special about how music is stored? Well, we we have many questions around that, and that's one uh, one of the questions. We don't really know how music is stored even in normal people. And it strikes us that studying this in people with dementia, uh, especially if music is preferentially spared, will tell us a lot about normal memory and about music in general. Uh, but that's early days yet. We don't know. And w since we tested EN, uh, we have now tested a, a small cohort of people and found that the phenomenon persists, not in everybody, but there are numbers of people who do have this ability to recognize tunes. Uh, not only to recognize the tune as familiar, but to also recognize if it's incorrect. In this case, and let's have a listen. Now, how did EN react to that? Yes, we couldn't explain, well, we want to, you to say if it's familiar or not, and we want you to say if it's correct or not. We just watched her, and uh, she enjoyed it, and she started to sing, and then the first wrong note came, and she looked uh, a little outraged or startled. And uh, sometimes she'd burst out laughing when it was wrong, or she'd say, in a very coherent way, that's not right. And this is not a woman who was a, a music teacher. She was someone who greatly enjoyed music, but um, she had it inside her that it was wrong. And uh, she scored perfectly on all the tests, uh, as well and sometimes better than a normal person. Dr. Zara, talk if you would about, we know that uh, exercise can be as helpful and even more helpful than many of the medicines that are available today. How important are the kinds of things we're talking about here, social interaction, engaging, um, uh, socially with others, how, how do you think they rank in terms of uh, improving the well-being of someone with Alzheimer's? Oh, I, I think they're all terribly important. I, I think one of the things that uh, we're hearing is that memory really is stored in a lot of different ways in the brain, and if you can't get at something in one way, you can get it in another way. We all do that when we have a tip of the tongue phenomenon. You know, we have we we know a name and we can't quite get it, but we may know uh, what it sound a little bit of what it sounds like. What, how many syllables there are, where the accent is, you may even know what the first letter is. So that suggests that memory is stored in different ways. And when you can use music like this, you can un unlock some things that are there. But all of it, I think, all of these different kinds of ways of reaching out to the person uh, with Alzheimer's disease is recognizing that we're still dealing with a person and not with a disease, that there's a whole person there and that we need to find ways of communicating and valuing that individual. And when we do that, that'll improve their quality of life and also help the family. Older populations are increasingly isolated. There are communities that are all older people. You do a lot of work with your wife, Dr. Whitehouse, uh, intergenerational work. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what you're seeing. Uh, my wife and I started a public school in Cleveland called the Intergenerational School in which a hundred urban city Cleveland youths come to a building to otherwise houses programs for older adults. And in that school they interact with um, adults, college students, high school students, but also seniors from the community. Um, our, our signature program is reading mentoring. So we. Uh, share stories uh, uh, with the older adults and the, uh, the youngsters. Um, the school has done well from the perspective of uh, uh, measurable impacts on children. So our children are reading better and, and uh, uh, doing uh, that well. So now what we're doing is kind of studying the impact on the older adults because we have some people with 
uh, memory problems, uh, cognitive challenges, some with labels of Alzheimer's disease, who also come to read to those children because they can read uh, the kindergarten and first and second grade uh, books and feel, as Steve said, a sense of purpose and a sense of uh, community. Now, Dr. Whitehouse mentioned uh, his intergenerational program, and you've done research that shows that there are hugely positive benefits for the children as well. Yes, uh, when you, I've studied a, a daycare program that brought together uh, young children, children actually from six weeks to five years, and older adults, all of whom had disabilities, uh, most of whom had cognitive loss of one kind or another. Now, the benefits to the older adults were apparent. You bring the kids in, and everybody's face lights up, even the most severely impaired uh, person with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and we have some results. My uh, former student, Shannon Jarrett, has looked at the benefits to the older people, and, and they're what you'd expect. Uh, much better, more positive feelings when the children are there than when the children aren't. But the lingering question was, for these very young children, what do the kids get out of it? So what we did is identified children who'd been out of the program anywhere from a few months to three years. And we went and interviewed them, we interviewed their parents, we interviewed their teachers, and we interviewed a control group of children, same ages, who came from uh, another high quality uh, child daycare program, but it was a single generation program. And what we found was that the, the children who participated in the um, intergenerational program had a greater amount of empathy, were more mm -hmm. willing to accept someone who was different from them, uh, and maybe a little bit better uh, maturity in the sense of being able to inhibit their own responses and instead respond to other people in a social situation. Well, now that you know more about the exciting work that these four people are doing, my guess is that some of you have questions. So I'm going to look around and wait for someone to raise their hand, and we'll get a microphone to you. And in the meantime, I want to talk uh, with you, Dr. Basting, about what impact of, at all does this have on reducing the frustration that sometimes is part of Alzheimer's disease? Well, we, we relied on studies we did in the, in the beginning, the, the very first study, which was um, 98 to 2000. And we interviewed staff members and family members for their observations about um, the changes that took place. And they talked about um, an increase of communication, and particularly an increase of initiation of communication, rather than simply just responding when spoken to kind of a thing. Um, and also a reduction, particularly on the day that storytelling was to take place, of anxiety. And when we were doing all these storytelling sessions, we always write down how many people begin the session, or we, we started out doing this, writing down how many began and then how many ended, because I assumed that people would get frustrated and maybe wander off. And I, I stopped writing that down because I actually never in the two years of that study had that happen. One person got up and went to the bathroom but came right back. <laughs> so, so we found actually that there was sort of this suspended magic moment, um, that, which is why I talk about making it a special event, um, that it's, it's not just around a, a craft table where everything else happens, including meals. It happens in a circle where everybody can see each other, and it's the, a repeated ritualized process so that it can get into what's, what we call procedural memory, that they actually learn this process and they open to it the longer that you do it. Um, so that's sort of, in a nutshell, what we found. And you're talking about a population uh, that has difficulty communicating when there are a lot of distractions. So mm -hmm. what is it that you do in this group that reduces the distractions and, and allows everyone to really participate? That's actually, those storytelling sessions are really chaotic. <laughs> I have a really, you saw in the video the, the girl Kim writing, Kim was so funny. The she's facilitator. Talking about intergenerational stuff. She started off in her um, baseline interview that we did with her. Um, I'm sorry, I really don't know why I'm here because I actually hate older people. Um, I'm a waitress and I just get stiffed all the time and they're really demanding and I don't know why I'm here other than it's credit, you know? And I think you can see from that tape that she's completely, tr she's laying on the floor in that tape and she's kicking her legs and she's having a great time. So talk about another transformation for the next generation of not stopping at their perception of what this is, just moving past it. And I'm, I've forgotten your actual original question. 
<laughs> oh, I was talking about distractions. You oh, got distracted you go. with that, but um, how you limit the distractions? But you said it's a chaotic. It's experience. pretty chaotic. What I was going to say is that Kim's writing down as fast as she possibly can, and you cannot get all of it down. I mean. We try to put maybe a couple of volunteers in the circle to echo back answers so you make sure you're getting them all. Um, but people can sustain the concentration. We do ask, when we do this in a, in a um, sort of residential setting, that staff, please don't come in and give them medication in the middle of our storytelling session. Please have respect for that because I think that's a really, talking about needing to change the culture of care, that's something that is really awful and happens all the time. They just come in and without telling the person, wheel them away and take them to therapy, to physical therapy. And you know, the person's like, I don't know what's happening to me. <laughs> so that's actually what, where we try to you know, break off interruptions in that way. All right, we have a question over here. Yes, um, well, with extending some of the wonderful work that you're, you're doing, um, what, if anything, is being found about communication outside of these uh, sessions? Is that improved for people? Um, and can things like asking EN to sing her request, uh, would that be helpful? Dr. Zaret? Well, I, th I think all of these things can be helpful outside of the uh, uh, immediate situation because they're teaching new ways of communicating and in, in my work over the years with families uh, one of the most important things is teaching them these kind of skills so they're not just hammering on uh, factual information what the date is uh, who the president is uh, but rather find these ways of communicating as, as Anne said earlier on an emotional level and it it does happen and, and it, it's really an interaction uh, I'd like to follow up on that. Um, EN would sing requests as well. <laughs> you could give her the words and she would come up with the music. Um, but uh, we get asked that all the time, that question about is, this, is doing this music going to uh, arrest the process of the disease or turn it backwards? And it's much too early for us to be able to say that it will do that. Instead, uh, I think that it, there is a lesson for us all to learn from people who have dementia, that they live very much in the present, but that doesn't mean they're not alive. And they have something to teach us about living in the moment. And it could be that all we are working with when we play music and see them respond is we're working with the, one of the things they have left. And there's joy, to use your word, there's joy in being able to communicate and share that in the moment we've got now. Uh, and, and joy not just for the patient, but for the family members who haven't been able to communicate in any other way, and for the caregivers around them. Uh, but it's still too early to say that music will reverse the process. It's definitely therapeutic from a palliative perspective. Dr. Duffin, um, stutterers often report that they can sing fluidly, and yet yes. the, the minute they begin talking again, the stuttering returns. Yes, perhaps the neurologist would like to comment on that, but uh, <laughs> I have an aunt. Uh, uh, I have an aunt. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't have that. <laughs> no, <laughs> I have an aunt who, who stuttered, but when uh, music was played and she was invited to sing, she could sing without a stutter, and then the stuttering would return. We have wondered if it's the rhythm in music. Uh, in the same way that poetry might do the same thing, that draws them out or somehow reduces scrambling of uh, thoughts in the brain, providing some kind of regularity. Music, it, you're finding, is spared, and you're, you're seeming to find uh, lots of people for whom that's true. Um, but oftentimes, social graces are often mm. spared as well. And I'd like both of you to comment on that. First you, Dr. Duffin. Uh, well, we saw that in many of the patients that we've tested, that you, you walk in and say, hello, how are you? And they come right back with, I'm very well. And uh, the normal social graces are still there. There are a number of skills that people can have preserved. We've learned of uh, two people who can still play the piano brilliantly, although they are um, in the severe category of uh, dementia. Uh, so there are various skills that do uh, remain. And, uh, yeah, there's a very nice program in, in uh, parts of Scotland. It's a home daycare where an ordinary person brings in a few uh, people with dementia and uh, they go through the normal social interactions that British people do every day. They sit down and have tea, they talk about it, they maybe have a little sandwich at lunch. And it's really just the social rituals. Mm -hmm. It's a very calm, comfortable, uh, pleasant setting. You 
contrast to that to the pathology we see in institutions where everything's routine, follow the rules, uh, get things done on time, answer the questions right, and it, it's such a refreshing difference. There is one thing, though, that we're really talking about, and I, I want to speak to those of you who are family members out, out there because we're skirting this issue. It's behind what we're saying. We're saying there aren't techniques that are going to restore the person to who they were before this uh, terrible disease happened to them. What we are saying is that there are ways to unlock those remaining skills. Mm -hmm. And for family members, that's a very difficult issue and a difficult transition to make. And I, I, I know that it can be very, very hard to give up on that hope that somehow something will happen that will unlock that person and bring them back to the way they were. But until we find that, these are all good things to do and the mm -hmm. best alternative that we have. In fact, the way you put it, Dr. Whitehouse, is that we uh, should focus some attention, more attention on the care than on the fantasy that there's going to be some single cure for Alzheimer's disease. That's right. Uh, as I said earlier, we would love magic bullets to fix everything that ails us. Aging, um, most people think, is a part of natural processes, although there's a whole bunch of doctors out there who practice something that they call anti-aging medicine to try to treat aging as a disease. And unfortunately, Alzheimer's disease is more complicated than something that can be, um, that can be fixed that quickly. So I actually believe that um, this is not just caring while we're waiting for a cure. I think a cure is, um, is um, so far, the word cure is almost irresponsible to use, let me put it that way. It's just, uh, it, the more you know about the brain, the more you know about the variability in Alzheimer's disease, the more we have to have realistic um, expectations about what we can do. And to my mind, care is always um, the most important principle because the likelihood that we are going to live forever and not die and not have to take care of each other and have that be the, the dominating principle to me is small. So I think there's too much energy focused on um, things that un, un, are un, un, unfortunately unrealistic. All right, I want to follow up with you in a moment about prevention and intervention, but I think we have a question over here on the left-hand side. I was uh, taken by the clip from Dr. Hastings' work uh, with the creativity that it uh, that uh, came up with sweet and sour squirrel. I was also taken by the fact that the people around the table sort of got that that was funny. And uh, I, I've noticed in my mother-in-law, who is fairly uh, well along in dementia, that she's developed a kind of wry and winsome sense of humor that I didn't notice when she was younger. And we've talked a little about music. I wonder if the panel could, uh, could uh, speak directly to humor and how that, how that relates to creativity and to, uh, to dementia. Uh, sure. I've, I've probably done hundreds, I don't know how many of these storytelling sessions. And in some of them, they write me into the story in very deliberate, funny ways. That, and sometimes they write themselves into the stories in very deliberate, funny ways that shows a sophistication of humor that I actually, you know, as I'm doing this work, I'm constantly actually finding my own biases. Like, I didn't think that was possible. There was one picture we used. It's actually a Robert Doisneau photograph of a, of a woman in, on a Paris park bench kind of lounging like this in a, in a winter coat, right? And then there's a painter who's painting a picture of a woman who's nude. And um, we, had, we had, you know, very boldly bring this in there. And um, the, the women in the group all named the character their own name. <laughs> and they they thought about it. So we had to, we these stories are very open. They, uh, the character can have ten names. So we named the character every single person's name. And every time we retold the story, we retell it quite often in the process. It was hysterically funny because they got what they were doing, and they got it every talk about living in the present. The joke is funny anew every time <laughs> you tell it. And. Um, I really have become very surprised. At, at, I started out surprised, but I'm no longer surprised at the sophistication of, of the humor. And it shows, I think, too, that we, um, along with the loss, can, can come 
some changes that are maybe shifts that family members can feel uncomfortable. My mom's, you know, I heard somebody say my mom's personality has gotten so much better. <laughs> um, she's letting go a lot of her anger and she's really so much more serene and playful, but, um, but I know she wouldn't have liked that, you know, and I, I feel uncomfortable about that even though I'm happy. So <laughs> it's a real challenge to, to be able to get yourself to a place where you can see gifts and see ch changes and maybe even, you know, talk about a bad word in Alzheimer's, but growth. Sir, you have a question. Yes, in the uh, village where we live, uh, we get professional help from time to time, and our professionals suggested uh, putting together photo albums. And I was wondering, does the panel have any experience with the use of photo albums to, in effect, get the juices flowing? We, we have a project called Life Book. Uh, did this with the uh, young man, Danny George. And it's exactly a scrapbook, but it's based around a structured interview of the person um, who uh, you're trying to celebrate their, their life. We think it's valuable because it's transportable. It, so when somebody, for example, makes a transition and goes into a long-term care facility for a short or long-term, perhaps the rest of their lives, the staff often don't know who that person is. And it's helpful for them to, to know what that person's values and and uh, what their, their memories are. Um, we also um, put in the back of the book the medical advance uh, directive, uh, which is important for everybody to have, but is often neglected by the, the healthcare uh, establishment, unfortunately. But the idea is if you're going to make a decision uh, for, for somebody if, you, if they're incapacitated, wouldn't it be good to th go through that book and just remind yourself of who that person is and then pull out that advanced directive, that cold and sterile document, and help make that decision for that person. So we have some experience. Um, years ago when my grandmother had Alzheimer's, I remember my brother saying something to me about why it was so uncomfortable for him to interact with her. And what he said was that he just didn't understand what the point was, really, in, in, at some level, just because she wasn't going to remember anyway. And, and I, I still, am, I mean, I was troubled by it. I, I have trouble understanding, empathizing with it. But I uh, suspect that maybe that is sort of a common sentiment that you might come up against. And I'm wondering also if you could comment on what that sentiment may say about how we understand personhood and relationships. Dr. Zerick, could you tackle that first? Well, I, I think that's a, a tough one. And I know that's something that a lot of people feel. Um, it's hard to know what people remember, and I think all of us who've been in the business for a while have, can talk about anecdotes where someone remembers something that we think they have no uh, possibility of, of uh, remembering, and then there's, and, and this is one of the things that frustrates families so much, because uh, uh, people with Alzheimer's sometimes remember the inconvenient things and forget the practical things. So there is some memory, but more than that, I think, uh, as all of us have been talking, there's the emotional experience of the moment and, and while the person may not be able to verbalize the content of that interaction, if it's a good experience they'll carry that forward, if it's a bad experience they won't. But I think he's also trying to say why is our reaction sometimes, well it doesn't matter what we do because they won't know and, and this is really gets down at its core to caring really, Dr. Whitehouse. Absolutely, I think Steve's right, you don't know what um that person is getting out of that interaction, for sure. Doctors make huge mistakes when they have a couple, one with a memory problem and the other one with a maybe slightly milder memory problem, um, and, and, and they only talk to the, the caregiver and they ignore the other person. There's another part that I was just thinking about. Um, when we're in relationship with somebody else, um, there's something that we're trying to learn about them in that relationship, but there's also something that we're trying to learn about ourselves in that relationship. So I think when you're having that kind of struggle, it's important to say, well, you know, what is it about me? Um, we, we are a, a society that values rationality back to the heart. Um, they used to pay neurologists more. They now pay cardiologists more. I don't know why. So the heart's more value, valued, perhaps. I don't mean in a pump sense. I mean that metaphorically, um, we, we need to attend to that, that, that emotional relationship, which can occur without words, of course. 
I'm going to get this question and then follow up with you, Dr. Whitehouse, about what you've been learning about in Japan. But go ahead, please. I hear you guys talking about, you know, the life books and music and things, but what I'm wondering about is my age. I'm in my 20s, right? And now my technology, my access to technology is that I can make music already on my own. I can use Technic programs. I can use digital cameras, blogs, things like that. Now, how is that going to incorporate your research once I reach Alzheimer's age? <laughs> Are you able to take that and use that to construe a life story for me because I'm wondering, now you guys have so many different technological variables added into this. What kind of personhood are you going to have in the end? Because it will be a very different means of creation when I was creative that far earlier and things like that. You can record videos, you can record photographs. I don't feel that this generation may have had as much access as I do now. Well, one of the things I think you would say though, Dr. Whitehouse, is protect her neurons now. <laughs> I actually think there is more um, potential in information technology, for even for this generation, than biotechnology. For example, in Norway, they've invested heavily in smart nursing homes, which monitor where people are and also adjust the thermostat and take care of being more responsible for the environment. And I can imagine, in, instead of having a television in these nursing homes, you'll have an interactive computer and television screen. And I, I believe that your generation, your computer will be monitoring your cognition and helping you in an interactive and symbiotic way. And I know my daughter, when she gets demented, it'll be her cell phone network that takes care of her, <laughs> not her parents. Now, moving to Japan, Japan is on the cutting edge of robots in general. I met a wonderful Norwegian seal. Now, this is Norway and Japan. They, 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 it's a harbor seal. It's a, it's a robot to provide comfort and care to older people. And they picked a harbor seal, because nobody knows what a harbor seal is supposed to do. A robot dog kind of looks a little awkward. Um, so uh, the, the connection here is to Japan that, that there is a technology side to this. And let me also tell you what they've just done in Japan. They have completely changed the word from dementia. There's a national campaign to eliminate the word chiho, which means dementia, uh, cognitive disease associated with idiocy, kind of like the word demented means in English. And they've changed it to nishi show, which means cognitive impairment. And they've got a national campaign to change that label. And so we, we're celebrating, as, as your promo said, the 100th anniversary of a diagnostic label. These labels are malleable. These labels have good effects on people. A case, it is useful to see a doctor when, you're, when you have a memory problem. However, they also have harm. They make victims. And so the Japanese government is literally changing the entire word that they use to characterize this condition that we're talking about this evening. Because words have power. Yeah. I wanted to add something, though, because first I want to say bless your heart for anticipating that you might get there. Because I think we live in a culture where we just don't do that. We don't anticipate. Like, think about, you know, London Bridge. What's your song going to be, right? That you react to? Like, mine's going to be some horrible journey song, right? And I'm going to be like, da da da. I'm going to be upset about that. But um, one thing that cultural critics, I think, have, have stumbled upon in a, in a world where they don't even think about dementia is that um, in a sort of technological info culture, they use, they use the um, sort of metaphor of dementia for how we have fragmented um, identities and that we feel somehow a sense of social amnesia, that we feel somehow disconnected. Um, they use that language a lot. And, and I think that there's some sort of simpatico in info culture that, at least from at the academic you know, abstract component, that I think that there's some room to merge there, at least with a level of understanding about an actual situation that we have that they relate to on a metaphoric level. Your focus, and I want to go back just for a moment, is on intervention and prevention, and, and you are, are quite serious about protecting the younger generation. Absolutely. Um, the problem in Cleveland and other cities have is lead, still lead. We've known for hundreds of years that lead kills nerve cells in children. I've asked the Alzheimer's Association, should they be concerned about that? I even now have a rat study, which really gets a lot of credibility amongst uh, people, that if you expose rats to lead early in life, they overexpress, they make more amyloid, the Alzheimer-related protein, later in life. So it's even possible that lead early in life might create those changes later in life. But even if it doesn't, if you kill nerve cells when you're one year old, those nerve cells aren't going to exist when you're 81 years old. We are 
putting more and more toxins into our environment. We have huge environmental issues. The, the potential for making us healthier are far greater from uh, modifying our environment than they are currently from modifying our genes, frankly. So let's take care of kids' brains. Let's talk about prevention starting, oh, I'm not going to guess your age, am I? <laughs> uh, a few years younger than you, even. <laughs> All right. I, I want to close with something that uh, I read last week in the New York Times, and that is that more than 5 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease, a 10% increase from the last official tally five years ago, and a number expected to more than triple by 2050. Absent a cure as the 85 and over population soars and the baby boomers move into their late 60s and 70s, increasing numbers of people will need to be cared for. And on that note, I'd like each of you to kind of give your take-home message based on some of the work you're doing. Dr. Duffin. Well, first, the increase in numbers is not just the aging population, but our increased alertness to look for it and apply a label. And I think you've heard from others than me on this panel uh, that we need to be very careful about that. Uh, but the short line is more music. <laughs> Yeah, my short line would be for families to know that there are things that can help in the situation and get help as soon as you can. I've had families tell me over and over through the years, I wish I knew, I wish I knew then what I know now. Is there an example of what they wish they knew then or uh, now? The, all the simple management things that make that the interaction with a person with uh, Alzheimer's easier. Uh, knowing not to press the facts, knowing how to respond to emotions, all those kinds of things. Dr. Baston. That's too hard. I've got too much. Um, I would say don't let the loss stop you. Um, just see what you can find when you push through it. And I would also say I think we're at a threshold radical moment when this is no longer about creating special services. This is about accessibility. It is your right to have the world accessible to you if you have dementia. And that flips sort of the way we think about it right now. A lot of programs should be open to you and you should insist upon it. Dr. Whitehouse? And I'm gonna continue that flipping and say we're all at risk for loss of memory when we get older. We all have it to one degree or another and it does exist on a continuum. That is not to say that some people don't suffer more because their brains age faster. But my answer to you is, let's put ourselves all in that camp of brain frailty that defines ourselves as human beings, and let's, not, let's answer the question, who needs care, and say absolutely every one of us. All right, thank you all so much for being with us. Dr. Jacqueline Duffin, Dr. Stephen Zaret, uh, Dr. Ann Basting, and Dr. Peter Whitehouse. For Penn State Public Broadcasting, thanks for watching. I'm Patty Satalia. Good night. This has been a production of WPSU. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.